Veterans Day, a day that we honor soldiers, male and female, of all the armed services that have gone to war over the past 242 years. Because it goes all the way back to the Revolutionary War, uh, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, Vietnam, we had Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, and, and various other conflicts even uh, in between those. But all these wars that have been fought by our soldiers that we can have the freedom to stand here today without fear of people barging in and, and taking us to jail because we want to worship the one true God. And that freedom that we have was not free. Uh, I had a PowerPoint display which was going to run in the background behind me, but um, do what? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I, th I didn't think it worked. Oh, look, Veterans Day. <laughs> so through this, it should rotate on its own, but if it don't, you'll have to just keep flipping through it until I say stop. Um, but our freedom is not free. It costs the lives of literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers so that we can have our freedom, so that we can have the freedom to open our mouth and say what we want to say. Some people shouldn't, but they have that right. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, three articles of paper that this country was founded on and totally paid for by the blood of our soldiers. And so we should honor our veterans, those that have served, those that are serving today. And the, and the sad thing is nobody likes war. The cost of war, the, 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 the destruction, the, the desolation, the death of husbands and fathers and sons and daughters being shipped off to another country to fight a battle so that we can be free here. No one likes war. But the one thing we need to understand War is inevitable. We will have war. You say, well, Richard, how do you know that? Matthew 24, 6 and 7, it says, Jesus speaking, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Jesus himself said, there's going to be war. There's going to be fighting. And understand, ever since Cain killed Abel, just outside of the garden, not in the garden, but just outside of the Garden of Eden, we have had death and violence and hatred and bitterness multiplying over these last 6,000 some odd years. We see in the streets today in America shootings, stabbings, people road rage, fights in the streets, it's absolutely incredible.
<laughs> it was supposed to run by itself and just keep going, but I will have to do that. So if I forget to flip it, just say flip it. <laughs> Woo. I just said that, didn't I? It's catching up with me. You know, I need to hire you to come up here and do this. So I, cause I'm, I'm going to forget. Here's Zena. You have a job. Just keep going through them. Give it. Oh, is it going by itself? By itself? Well, I was touching it. We're right there. Yeah, it goes that way. So I don't have to worry about that. But Jesus said there are going to be wars. And we're seeing in the streets the violence and the fighting in our own country. But that's what the Civil War was about, was fighting in our, in, in, uh, between states in our own country. And we're still seeing that. We're still seeing people screaming and fighting over politics. The left fighting the right, and the right fighting the left, and then in the middle they're fighting left and right. And I don't know who's all fighting who, and they don't know either, but they just want to get in the middle of a fight. <laughs> Back when I was still at the prison, one morning I had to take some inmates to the bus station in Effingham, which is a very common thing we do every week. And so I dropped them off the bus station. You can't leave. You get their tickets and everything, and you can't leave until you see them on the bus and the bus is pulling off. And so the, the bus driver's there. The bus pulls in. This is the right bus. I give the inmates their tickets. They take their stuff. I watch them get on the bus, and when they get on the bus, the driver of the bus kicks a man off because he's drunk. And he said, you can't be on the bus when you're drunk. A lady on the next bus over saw that, gets out, and starts yelling and cussing at the driver. You can't treat him that way. He's no kid. Blah, 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 blah. And I thought, what does she have to do with what's going on here? But she had to get involved. And she's causing this ruckus and carrying on. And we see that all over the world. We see countries right now. Almost every country fighting, bickering, or threatening to fight all over the world. The countries, I mean, the world's on the verge of another world war. And so, do what? Yeah. And, and so what I want to talk about today it's three wars. Jesus said that nation will rise up against nation. That's the first war. Country against country. Every nation in the, you know, it's interesting, the Bible has predictions. And we see these predictions. If you would look, if you would look at the prediction the day it was given, it wouldn't have made no sense. But you look at the prediction, now looking back when it was given as to what's going on today, and the prediction is just like, man, that fits like a glove. Such as, Israel will be a cup of trembling for all nations. Every nation in the world, except the United States right now, and maybe one other, but every nation in the world is against Israel. But yet there's another prediction that says that all, at the end of time, all nations, hear what I'm saying, all nations will be coming against Israel. All includes the United States. But right now, one of the greatest things that has happened, in the, and I don't want to get off on this, but I might, 
one of the greatest things that has happened this year, biblically speaking, is that President Trump made the declaration that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. That is huge. That is enormous prophetically. Politically, it looks like, well, no big deal. Prophetically, it's huge. It's huge. And that just says we're getting closer to the end. We're getting closer. But country will rise against country. In Ezekiel, it talks about the king of Tyre. And it talks about this king of Tyre and his wisdom and, and different things. But one of the things it says about him, how, how smart he is and how, how brilliant he is, but it says that he was in the Eden, the garden of God. Now listen, the king of Tyre was not in Eden, the garden of God. What Ezekiel is speaking of there is the entity, the demonic force that was behind the king of Tyre. That force was Satan. And he was in the garden of God. Four, I'll use this word, four people was in Eden. Adam and Eve, God, and Satan. And so when Ezekiel says, you were in, you with all your wisdom... And all your beauty, you were in Eden, the garden of God. He's talking about Satan. But he's referring to the king of Tyre. So what we see from that picture, and when Jesus just told, you know, he tells Peter, you're going to be the rock. From now on, your name's going to be Peter, the rock. And then a few chapters later, he turns around and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Talking to Peter. Was he speaking to Peter? No, he was speaking to the entity that was using Peter to try to stop Jesus. Jesus knew that. And what I want you to see in this country versus country, because we don't fight against flesh and blood. Even though we are at war with people, we see that people are used of Satan just like Judas was. And here's what I want you to get. Even though we may go to war with Syria, we may go to war with Russia, we may go to war with whatever country, our war is not with the people. It is with the forces that are behind the people that are coming against us. Every single war, somebody was in leadership, and that leadership listened to a thought that entered in his head. Take Hitler. He was a little nobody, but yet he listened to that voice. And he entertained that thought. He meditated on that thought. He used that thought and brought World War II around. And we almost, almost would be speaking German today if it wasn't for the grace of God. Because what he did was very good. But we were better. So even though we fight countries... There is a force behind that country that we need to be very much aware of because we don't fight against flesh and blood. Our warfare is in the spiritual, and that's exactly what the next war I want to talk about. It's kingdom versus kingdom. Jesus said, nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom shall rise against kingdom. There is a war going on with the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of our Lord. The kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. 
And every single one of us are in that battle. Every single one of us are in that battle. All these wars, and I'm gonna, well, we're going to look at three that I want to bring out. Because I, I, I'll be honest, I watch a lot of war movies. I like watching war movies. I've got a whole set of World War II that I watch repeatedly, and it's like 500 hours of World War II, and I like watching it. So I know a little bit about war, even though I've never been in the military. But every single one of us are in a war, and every war is planned. It doesn't just happen. You don't just give people guns and go say, okay, go find them, kill them. It's planned. They are trained. Soldiers are trained. They are equipped. They are given instructions. They are given leadership. They're given maps. They're given all the equipment they need to do and carry out the mission that they're assigned to do. And that's just like us. Church is a place of training. We learn. Just like just like Samantha was talking and Jed was talking about prayer. That was warfare. No, that was just prayer. No, that was warfare. That was warfare. In Vietnam, this is interesting. Oh, let me read something. In Vietnam, in Vietnam, they had what was called fire bases. A fire base was up on top of a hill, and they would have three, four, five, six cannons sitting up there, and all the men and ammunition it took to operate it. Somebody off 20 miles away would be fighting the enemy, and they would call a fire base and said, we need fire support at this coordinates. And they would give these coordinates, and these guys would run out there, adjust their cannons or tubes, they would adjust that stuff, start loading them in and firing them just as fast as they could load them guns. And those shells were going to exact location where those coordinates were. Now here's something cool. Those people firing those cannons never saw the enemy. They had no idea where they were at. They just knew here's the coordinates, we've got a command to fire, and buddy, they let it rip. And all that Munitions come down and did its job to support the men on the ground down there. We have missionaries that are in other countries, and they call us to pray. Something may be going on in that country. Something may be going on with them. I don't know. But here's the thing. If we get down on our knees... It's like a fire base. I start lifting up a mission team. I start lifting up these people. And those prayers, one after another, and if we get a team of the intercessors together and they start praying and they lift up, we fire round after round. And we don't see it happen in the natural, but in the kingdom of darkness, it does massive damage. Just like the fire bases. Everything in the natural, everything, trees, nature, everything is a picture of what's going on in the spiritual. And as we lift our brothers and sisters up in prayer, it is like firing artillery. Let me read something to you. Ephesians chapter 6, we've heard this a dozen times. Starting in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. See, he's got plans. The wiles of the devil, he's got plans. And we need to be trained to see what he's doing, that we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take 
uh, unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day having done all to stand, stand. Let me just talk about that for a little bit. I've heard people use that verse real quick. And they said, Brother Richard, I've done all I can to stand. I'm just standing. I'm just standing. <laughs> well, not according to that verse, you ain't. Because that verse is saying, having done everything, being trained, being equipped, being told exactly how it's going to happen and where to do it, everything to stand, now then you take a stand and you move forward. That's what that verse means. That we take a stand against prayer in school. That they stop that? No, we need to get it back. That we take a stand against abortion. That we take a stand against gay marriage, that we take a stand against those things that are wrong, that are coming into this world, it's under attack, and we're losing ground. Patton said, told his troops, he said, I do not want to hear that we're holding ground. He says, we need to be taking ground. You can't win a war by holding ground. You have to take it. The Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That means that when we attack the gates of hell, they've got to come down. But the thing is, we take it as we can stand against the gates of hell. I'm doing all to stand. No, you're doing nothing. Having all equipment, all knowledge, being built up, edified, trained, filled with the Spirit, given the sword of the Spirit as a, as a weapon, then take a stand and move forward and take ground. Win the battle. Win the battle. Not hunker down and hide from it. Stand therefore, listen to what it says, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, where, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. When he fires at you, it is your faith that stops it. And the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And they always stop there. Boom, I'm a soldier. I've got my shield. I've got my helmet. i got my breastplate on. i got my feet shod. I'm ready to go. i got the sword. I'm Zorro. I'm ready to do this thing, you know. But it doesn't stop there. And it says, praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, watching thereunto, and supplication for all saints. That's the artillery, is our prayer. We've got, we've got people trained. This is what church does to build up, edify, equip you. Jesus, when he died on that cross, he said, I have given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. We need to appropriate it. We need to learn. Our biggest problem is we check our brain at the door and we come in and, and we want someone to entertain us for like an hour or two and then we can go home and say, I've done God a favor. I showed up. And that's not what we're here for, people. We're soldiers in the army of the Lord. All through Scripture, there's warfare. All through Scripture, there is warfare. In 1 Timothy 1.18, it says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them might war a good warfare. We are in a warfare it is a spiritual battle. Flesh and blood is not our enemy. It is the kingdom of darkness that we're fighting. 
and our weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. And this is the third battlefield that I want you to understand. I call it spirit versus flesh. It's the battle of the mind. Just like when Satan came up to Judas, he said he put it in his heart. He put it in his heart to betray Jesus. And then later on it says, and then he entered in. Our minds are at war with the spirit. The Bible says that your, that your spirit wars against the flesh, and the flesh wars against the spirit. My flesh wants things it cannot have. Well, let's get it personal. Your flesh wants things it should not ever get. So we as Christians are in this fleshly tent, this tabernacle, this body. I remember I went to a conference. It was a demonology seminar down in uh, Cleveland, Tennessee. Norval Hayes, I don't know if you've ever heard of him or not. He was big back in that day. I'll drink to that. And... Um, we went, I went down to his conference, and he was talking about, he's a millionaire. He's a multimillionaire. And uh, he became a Christian after he was a millionaire, and his wife didn't like it. She liked the glamour, the glitz, and the, and the woo-hoo of the money and the fame and the million, you know, how it is. Well, I don't. I've never been there, but I, you know how it is. And uh, they couldn't get along because he was committed to the Lord. And so she divorced him. And uh, he said he was sitting on the bed one night. He was a smoker. And he was getting his life straight, as all of us have to do. And there's issues in all of our lives that we have to overcome. This is a battle of the flesh. And he said he was sitting on the bed one morning. He got up. and He was sitting there, and his body yells at him, I want a camel. He yelled back, you ain't getting a camel. I said, I want a camel. You're not getting a camel. Then give me a Marlboro. And, it just, and this battle was going on in his mind, and he refused to give his body what it was craving. When I crave chocolate, which is often, I give in. Because I feel chocolate solves a lot of problems. <laughs> but there are some things that our body craves that we have to resist, and it's a battle. But yet we have been equipped with all the weapons of our warfare to overcome and win every battle. In this country, we celebrate a freedom that most countries don't have. They're fighting that with some of our freedoms. I really feel one of these days, me standing here preaching anything about Jesus is going to be illegal someday. Maybe not in my lifetime, but someday it will be illegal. I see that happening. This is becoming a hate book. Certain um, internet providers are removing anything Christian. They can have anything else, but anything Christian, they're removing it. We're seeing an attack on Christianity in this country like never before. Like never before. I want to tell you something else. I'll say it right here. You can write it down. If it happens, you can say, Richard's a prophet. If it don't happen, you can say, it was still cool. 
I think one of the biggest things against the church coming up, now let me say this the way I want to, let me think. I'll put it this way and then I'll explain it. It's going to be other churches. It's going to be religion. The reason I say that is because the biggest problem Jesus had wasn't with sinners. It wasn't with the Roman soldiers. Centurions came to him for help. What he had the biggest trouble with was the Pharisees, a religious order. It was the religious order that got him nailed to that cross. I understand that was the plan. Jesus came to die. I understand that. But I want you to understand it was a religion at that time that was against him. And that religion claimed it was for God. And I believe one of the biggest battles that we're going to see, I don't know if it's in our lifetime, I'm, I'm seeing a division now among churches. I see mainstream churches accepting all kinds of abomination. And then look at us and wonder why we don't. I hear the word progressive church. We're a progressive church. We're progressing. We're moving forward. We're doing great and wonderful things. But that's all of the world. I don't see anywhere in the scripture that God says, be progressive. In fact, he says, come back to me. That's what repentance means. Return back to me. And so many churches today are moving forward with what the world, what the people want, not what God wants. God's called us to be holy. And it's, uh, he also says repeatedly, Get, bring yourself out of that. Get away from them. Separate yourself from that. Come out and be ye separate. We're to be different. And to be different, we're going to have to be tough. When Jesus died on that cross, he gave us a freedom. Freedom from sin. Freedom from hell. Literally freedom from ourself if we're willing to go that way. But the freedom that we have wasn't free. The price that he paid is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Because he had to be, not only, yeah, he died. And you can say, oh, well, Richard, so, you know, two others died on the cross with him. You don't get it. When he was in heaven, he was the word. Whatever that was, I don't know. But he had everything there, and he gave it up forever because he is a man forever. There is forever a man in heaven seated at the right hand of God making intercession for us. He gave that up and came to this earth as a man and had nothing here. But he fought a war. He fought a battle, and he won. And that price that he paid, paid for our freedom from sin, from sickness, from disease, from hell. Freedom isn't free. Whether it is a country, whether it's kingdom against kingdom, against light, against darkness, are you battling the flesh. There's a war. And there forever will be a war until Jesus comes back and rules from Jerusalem. There will always be war.
There will always be war until he comes to remove it. Revelation Revelation 21, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither will there be any more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true, and they are faithful. This will happen. Till then, we're on a battlefield. The church was born on a battlefield. And it's time that we, the army of the Lord, rise up, having to done all to stand. We stand. We take a stand. We move forward. We take ground and, and with, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we speak those things just like Jesus did. And when we can't see the enemy, we fall on our knees and we pray. And that artillery shells will bombard the kingdom of darkness and do damage that you don't even see. You may be praying for people across the world Christians over there that are being persecuted right now today and we can fire salvo after salvo of high explosive prayer into that situation and change that situation. You have been equipped. You have been trained. It's time to move forward and take ground. Because even in the Christian world, we have veterans. We celebrate them. Yes, today we celebrate Veterans Day. And I thank God for every, every soldier that ever put on a uniform. From the, from the White House to whatever the lowest soldier is, I don't even know. But if they served, then we need to be thankful. And every Christian that's gone on before us, that's blazed a trail for us, we need to be thankful for them too. Pick up the sword, pick up the path where they quit, and we move forward. And we take this country back from the enemy that so desperately wants it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Zena, for doing my thing. I appreciate that. Father, I thank you and I praise you for this day. I thank you for each person that's here today, Lord. Father, I thank you for the blood of Jesus that has set us free. Free from sin, free from hell, free from sickness and disease and poverty and everything, all the, all the blessings that you have poured out upon us. I thank you for blessing America. I thank you for blessing each one of us. Lord, I bless you. I say thank you, Lord. I love you. I praise you. And Lord, I lift up our, our 
all of our servicemen and women from every, no matter who, where they're serving at, whether it's here, whether it's in the ocean, whether it's on land, in the air, it doesn't matter what branch, Lord. I ask your blessing upon them. Bless our president, Lord. Give him godly wisdom. Surround him with godly people, Lord. The new members of Congress and the, and the Senate, Lord. I pray for this country. You made this country. I feel as if we've turned our back on you. Let us turn again to you, Lord. Let us come back to you. That we bless you, that we worship you. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this room of warriors. That we go forth in battle, filled with the Spirit with all weapons, with all knowledge, with angels surrounding us, before us and behind us, for we know there are more with us than there are against us. And we say that this country, this city, this county, this state, this country, will worship you again as a people, all of us. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. You are dismissed in Jesus' name. If you, the prayer team will be up here, if you have a uh, prayer need.